seems like every day we go racing down here with the AC75s, the bar gets raised that bit higher. Speeds increase, we're now seeing 50 knots on the race course, and the racing gets closer as well. As spectators, we're starting to get our heads around when a boat looks like it's under control and when it's getting a little bit out of shape. All of which has started to shift some of the focus of interest, certainly among spectators, as to how these boats are actually handled by their crews. Well, to find out, I went and talked to someone who's an absolute foiling guru. He's been an America's Cup helmsman himself, and he's been watching these boats for months, trying to understand what makes them tick. Now that person is Nathan Outridge, and if you haven't seen part one of this two-part feature, I strongly recommend you take a look. It's very interesting stuff indeed. Now, just before we kick off with part two, a quick word about a competition we're running. You've probably noticed in this America's Cup series that we've had Spinlock sponsoring us and helping us through. Thank you very much, guys. It wouldn't be possible without you. Now, they've enjoyed the journey so far as well, and they want to give away some stuff. All you have to do is to subscribe to Planet Sail, leave us a comment saying love the commentary, and follow Spinlock on Instagram. Do that and you're in the draw. Right, here's part two. First question is, what's the hardest maneuver to do in the, in the 75? Well, I, you know, I've watched them a lot, as you said, and you know, there's, there's tacking and jibing of the maneuvers where you've got to get foils up and down, and then there's turning the corners. And, you know, if you compared it to the catamarans, the jibe was kind of easier and the tack was harder, but watching them sail and chatting to people on board, they say the tack's actually almost a bit easier than the jibe, just with the way the inertia and the physics work. And it's also got to do with the speed at which the boat's going. You know, you're firing down this windward foil, doing 45 knots of speed, it's going to turn the boat aggressively and the rudders are quite narrow and thin. So I think tacking and jibing in the medium breeze is pretty easy for these guys now. But when it's breezy, like we saw with Team New Zealand the other day, the jibe is hard because you've got to get the foil down, stabilise the boat, turn it. The longer you glide, the more speed you wash off, the more the apparent wind comes off. When you bring the board up, if you are aiming too high, the boat heals, rudder comes out, capsizes. So I think the jibe is actually a lot harder than the tack, whereas in Bermuda it was, I thought, the other way around. The, the jibing was an easier manoeuvre than the tacking. The bottom arc roundings also look really tricky to me. Because as you go around the bottom mark, you got seven tonne of boat going at 45 knots downwind and you're going to do a 90 degree turn or even sharper to go upwind so the boat wants to keep going that way and so as you go around the mark there's a huge skid, leeway skid which is really hard to control and the flight controller is like really focused on keeping the height right. If you fly too high, massive skid. If you fly too low, lower heel potential capsize and you really need to keep the boat flat. The big thing is with the single rudder and that foil way out to leeward Heel's super critical on these boats, so any time a boat gets heel, it's not going to end very well. So what a lot of the teams are doing is they're dropping the windward board to do the roundup, and what that does is it grips the whole platform flat. And so sail trim becomes a little bit less critical, and the flight controller can just manage heel with the two boards. So I'm guessing the windward foil is sucking really hard to stop it tipping over, and then they wind the flap back out, and then when they find neutral on the windward foil, they bring it back up. Now it's probably slower than doing the perfect roundup with one board, but Are they allowed to stay for as long as they want with the, because uh, in the, certainly in the AC-72s, I think it was the case in the 50s, pretty sure it was, that you were only allowed to have both foils in the water. And there was a time limit, was it 30 seconds or something, through a manoeuvre? There was that rule before. I don't, honestly, I don't know if that rule exists still. it doesn't still. look like it now, because they're putting it, as you say, for those mark roundings, seem to be a lot longer than we used to see on the cats. Yeah, well, they're, they're basically doing it to get around the bottom mark, to minimise that leeway skid, to minimise the risk of a crash, knowing they're going to drop a bit of pace. But you watch the pre-start, they spend a lot of time with both boards in the water. The starting box is the width of the course. And if they went through and tried to do a pre-start like we were doing in Bermuda at the speeds it's, these boats go, particularly when it's windy, they get to the boundary in like 25 seconds and now they've got a minute and a half to kill. So they are either doing lots of circles or they're sailing with both boards down going half speed. Um, 
So I, I'm guessing there's a, the rule mm. doesn't prevent them from doing mm. that, otherwise no one would be doing it. Mm. In, in the cats, and also in things like 49ers and all kinds of high performance boats, be it a NACRA, 49er, AC50, whatever it is, the bear away is the most frightening bit in a way, isn't it? in a breeze, because mm. you've just got to get through that nasty death zone and get downwind as quick as you can. Yep. Do you think that's the case with these boats? Yeah, I think the same principles apply for this boat doing that bear away. It's, it's, it's the highest speed maneuver and you've got to basically transition from upwind to downwind punching through the power zone. In the light to medium airs, it's a great slingshot, but when it starts to get breezy, it's quite hard. And I think the, the issue arrives when you're doing close to cavitation on the foils during this bear away, which for these boats looks like it's around the 50 knot range. You know, we've seen boats going over 50 through the bearaways and you know I've heard rumours of them doing 53, 54 really? kind of speed. So if we get a breezy day we'll see that for sure. But the biggest, most important thing is is that if you keep the speed up and you keep the apparent forward, you don't have to ease the sails much at all. If you try to turn it too quickly and you get any form of heel, it's gonna end in a disaster. So the whole everything they're trying to do is just skim the hull but not too much to slow it down, just keep it flat, keep the leeward foil at a good ride height, keep that rudder in. As they go away, I bet you they're dropping a lot of rudder lift to lift the nose because as the apparent comes aft, it drives the bow down. So it'd be, an, it'd be a dump of rudders going into the turn. Flap would be controlling your height. You'd be trying to only ease sail if you need to. You drop a bit of travel, maybe twist slightly. And as soon as you're through the power zone, it sheet the main back on, put the rudder lift back in, get the traveler back up. And so, if in doubt, you can just ease it out and keep the windward heel and skim it. Um, looks like if you did that with a lot of rudder lift out and you skimmed flat, it's pretty safe. But if you got it wrong, it would be a huge disaster. Like any boat doing 45 knots with a nose dive, it's not gonna end well. I mean, it seemed, as you described that, it seemed, I mean, that was, a lot of that was what happened with Team New Zealand in their capsize, or at least before the capsize, mm. it appeared anyway. What struck me about that capsize was, obviously there's the point at which they, you know, the rudder comes out and it's basically all over. But the other thing that struck me was that as they're sailing along with lots of heel and they're out of shape, they're gonna be slowing down. That's not a quick way to sail. So if they're slowing down, presumably, the apparent wind direction is starting to creep aft, mm -hmm. and the more they slow down, the more it comes aft, and, the and it. then it's pushing the top of the rig forward. And of course, on these boats, you don't have any form stability fore and aft because you're just relying on foils. And if mm -hmm. the foils aren't gripped, end of story. Well, this is the thing: is, is like you look at where the foils are positioned in the boat. You've got the rudder obviously at the back, and the foil mid to sort of maybe clip forward. You know, talking to a few of the designers and a few of the sailors and trying to get an understanding of how this boat is different to a catamaran and how it might be similar to, say, a moth. You know, a moth, typically the rudder is lifting, but sometimes it's sucking. It's the same on this boat. You know, generally the rudder is doing a little bit of lifting in a straight line for them. If the apparent comes off like it does in the bear away, it's actually sucking the transom down. In tacks, it's lifting the transom up. So what they've said is the rudder adjustment is super critical and it's very, very active. You know, they're adjusting the rudder all the time to keep Who's the trim. Doing that? Well, it depends on which boat you're on. You know, I was watching Ineos really closely and they call pitch rudders. Right. Okay, and you listen to Giles and he's saying, my pitch. So he's sitting to lured with the, the throttle and he's adjusting the pitch. And then he'll say, your pitch Parker. So Parker's one of the flight controllers and Lee McMillan is the other one. So based off a lot of analysis, I believe that whoever's on the leeward side out of Parco and Lee is doing flap foil, the windward person is doing the pitch on the rudder, and Giles every now and then says, I'll take the pitch so you can grind and give the boys some power. In the manoeuvre, Giles is doing the pitch, and the boys are doing their foils on either side. So it's, it's a big combination. You look at, say, um, Prada, and in a straight line, the helmsman's doing the rudder pitch. You can see the twist grip on the wheel. So Bruni and Jimmy are doing rudders when they're driving. The guy on the leeward side will be doing the flap. When they tack though, someone else on the boat. I asked them, they didn't tell me who, but they said someone else takes rudders through the tacks and they go to foils on either side and the person initiates the turn and mid turn, the other person takes it over, but they've got those sliders. So they 
transition to flat, and then on the exit they take, they say, my rudders, my traveller which to me means that, you know, they take the rudders and then they have an ability to trim the traveller while Pietro crosses around the back. So you think there's three people involved in these boats, but it's a big job share. Amongst Amazing, everyone. isn't it? Quite and potential if, to get it wrong. <laughs> huge potential to get it wrong. So with the simulators, it's not just a couple of people using it. You know, I'm sure Josh and Andy, part of Team New Zealand, they get involved in trimming the jibs and the tacks, but the other person's often flying one of the foils for Blair because I could imagine for Blair it would be really difficult to do two boards and the rudder and the tack so for sure mm. he's got, he's got assistance there. But I think uh, I guess for, for people who, who fly that sort of starts to I mean, fly as an aviation flyer mm. that sort of makes sense in a way in that you you can imagine you're flying along and actually you would adjust the trim which is essentially what you're saying and that's the pitch of the aircraft yep. and that does feel natural if you're flying to just be adjusting the trim mm -hmm. but I guess you've got someone else controlling the roll is essentially what we're, what we're saying. Yeah, the, the, these boats are very three-dimensional. It's like, okay, we've got to adjust height, trim, they're kind of linked, and roll. So roll mm. is with the wheel and with the trim of the sails. And then you've got power to get the thing out of the water and then to flatten it all out to pick which mode you want to sail. So combination of roles going yeah. Really complicated, way more complicated than people sort of Yeah, think. exactly. Uh, one of the other things that struck me since I've been watching them and going back to what you were saying about putting both foils down in the water for manoeuvres, I was trying to, in trying to get it into my head as to what was roughly going on, it, it struck me that, of course, it's very much like an aircraft because you both, when both of those uh, uh, foils are down in the water, you've basically got an aileron on each side. So mm -hmm. it's a bit like an aircraft and you put the aileron one way and you roll it that way and you roll it the other. And in an aircraft, that's what you want to do to turn. You want to roll it to turn. But of course, in these boats, you're doing exactly the opposite. You're using the ailerons to keep it flat to do the turn, which you'd never do in the air. You can't turn like that. Mm. But I guess it's the yeah. same kind of principle, isn't it? And so the flaps are going to have to work in opposite directions as they go through the turn. Yep. yep. And then you've got to... And then you were saying it in commentary the other day about how if you if one foil is still sucking down on the leeward side for example you come out of a maneuver and it's mm. still sucking down and you've taken the windward one out early suddenly it's not contributing to your writing mode it's just trying to pull you into the drink yeah well it's it's the same principle of what we had on the catamarans and that when you're going in a straight line you're going to drop the windward board into the water so the goal for all these teams and i think it's a lot easier on one of these boats than a catamaran you slide it in and the reason why it's easier is because the rake of the foil is preset, you know, you can't adjust that. It's just the flap on the back of it. Whereas we would often struggle to get the board down at the correct angle to attach flow. And once you've got flow, then you can turn. So they're going to throw that foil down. They'll probably have a preset for flap neutral. And then when the board goes into the water, the goal is to transfer all the weight from the leeward foil to the new windward foil during the turn in a smooth manner. And so you'll have a dedicated person to each side, or maybe you've got a really talented person who can do both. Maybe um, Blair and um, Andrew Campbell, or who are sitting at the front, get a hand for each foil or something. But basically you'll be sort of flat down on the leeward side, giving lift. The windward side, you'll be flat neutral. As you turn, you're literally gonna go flat down on the new foil and flap up on the old foil, transfer the load, and on the exit, maybe you're even flap up to generate riding moment to build, and then as the foil comes out, you'll flap it and smooth it out. And so you're basically, the goal will be keep the boat flat during the turn, let the rudder turn the boat, and, and use the flaps to maintain a flat boat. And all the while, if you get the main sheet or the traveller trim wrong and you get too much heating moment, all of that goes out the window. I presume if the boat starts to heal. Yep. So, so it's a, you know, you can heal the boat with foils or you can heal the boat with, with the, the sails. And as you go through the head, head to wind, the rig kind of starts to do nothing. So it's all about foils to control the heel. And as the power starts coming back in, you've got to work out when to bring the board up. Because if you bring it up too soon and the sails aren't taking enough load, you'll crash to windward. And if you keep it in for too long and you're in negative and then when you pop it out, it'll go the other way. But these boats have got sensors everywhere. Mm. And I bet you, and I, I know this for a fact because we had it on all the boats in Bermuda, there are sensors, fibre optics, telling you the force at which the foil is under. So is the flap generating lift or is it generating negative? And you could put a graphic display, for example, and it could just be a green bar graph 
and it, with a number it says 800. So it's got 800 kilos of positive lift. And then as soon as it gets, bar graph goes to like zero or goes into the red, the number goes in the red, okay, now you've got 300 kilos of suction on that foil. So you would just tweak the flap until it sits at about 100 kilos plus or minus, pull it out, and it would be a very smooth transition. So you look at the flight controllers, are they looking at the foil or are they looking at a screen? And they're probably doing a bit of both, and some teams have got bloody cameras and all sorts of stuff in there mm. to aid them and all that too. So there's a lot of computer assistance for these guys, but the fundamental physics is important for everyone to understand. And all the while you're still trying to race someone else. That's what gets me. I mean, it's enough just to sail it in a straight line around corners, and then you've got to call tactics, pull off maneuvers, and on top of all of that, be prepared to go in for the kill and get frighteningly close to someone else. Well, that's why it's a team sport. You know, some of the team members are to make the boat go fast. Some of the team members are to make it manoeuvre. Some of the team members are to power generate so that those who want to make decisions can actually do it. And as a decision maker, as a helmsman or a tactician, you know, thinking, say, Team New Zealand, Peter's basically calling a lot of the decisions. He's cross-checking with Glenn. Glenn bounces it up to Blair. He throws it back to Josh or Andy at the back. While they're talking, everyone's listening and going, OK, if they do this, I've got to make sure I can do X, Y, and Z. But Pete needs to know that they need three seconds to, to make that work. So there's a lot going on on the boats. And that's why training's super critical, understanding your equipment and some of the boats can maneuver better than others because of a design reason or because they've actually as a group just created a really mm. good plan on how they're going to sail the boat. When uh, we were back in the old lead mine International America's Cup class boats, I remember talking, well I went out on lots of training runs with teams and, and, the, and when they're out doing a big training run up a two mile beat up the Haraki Gulf and what have you, crews will be huddled down there, sitting there for 20 minutes doing nothing, maybe one the hand a little bit every once in a while. And would have bursts of activity around the mark. And it was quite hard really, because they weren't doing much. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that this is, this is completely the opposite. This so, is the whole crew learning a completely new discipline. Completely opposite. People say that these boats have less crew work than the old boats with the spinnakers and the jibs. And, Visually, yes, off the boat you look at it, there is no spinnaker hoist, there is no potential for a ripped spinnaker or a trawled spinnaker or the jib to go in the water when it comes down or a pole to break. That's all visual and yes, at those moments you needed 17 people to sail that boat, but in a straight line they were probably sailing it with three or four. The understanding of the boat to actually get them to go in a straight line and to manoeuvre is far more advanced, I believe, than what it used to be. There used to be, you know, set plays, okay, you've got to trip this and hook that and get the jib and the cart up, and everyone in the world with the cameras can see it. Now it's all software. Mm -hmm. It's like you push that button, and I guarantee you, the team that does the best here is the team that had the sailors the most involved in the design of the boat. Not just sail design or foil shapes, but they would say, we want the boat to be able to do attack, and a jibe and then a round up and we want to be able to trim both foils and we want to be able to put it up and put it down and we want that guy to do it and that guy to do it and if he can't do it we want this guy to do it so they've got to have this whole software code mapped out and you know if you've got three or four key sailors working with your software designers to create that architecture that's the team that's going to have the most flexibility when they race and you know I believe Team New Zealand were a step ahead when we got to Bermuda last time because they did everything with their hands while spinning their legs. Mm. Everyone else was trying to do it with their feet and you just don't have the same finesse. So I get the feeling they're still a little bit ahead with that, but the other teams are closer. Well, enough. I was going to ask you about that because when we, when we arrived here, um, the, the early sort of testing sessions, I was hearing people coming off, I was hearing rumours that people were saying, crikey, the Kiwis are even further ahead now than they were when they arrived in Bermuda last time. I'm getting the sense that that gap has closed up. What do you think? Well, I agree with what you said. I think when everyone got here, they were a bit shocked. Personally, I wasn't because I was here out foiling every day, watching them and just being like, they have not gone backwards since Bermuda. They've got a boat that's obviously different, but they've, they've kept advancing, which you'd expect. But the beauty of software is, is you just rewrite the code, you add a few more bits of hardware with buttons and switches, and you can change that. Know, software design is going to hate me when I say this, but you can change it pretty quickly. You don't have to fundamentally rebuild mm. a foil that takes 
three months. You just got to sit there and cleverly work out the software code and sometimes it's how, how much flow rate you can get through a cylinder to move that actuator quick enough. So I think that Team New Zealand were sailing the boat and, and their goal was always just keep pushing and pushing and don't hide too much and just keep developing quicker than everyone else. And everyone else has seen what they're doing here and they're like, right, we've got to stop sailing for a week and we've got to rewrite our software code because we need, and this is why the teams are complaining so much about the foil cant system. Because, you know, if you can't control your foil cant effectively and you can't control the flaps on your foils properly, you're going to look like an idiot because the boat doesn't do what you want it to do. So, you know, when Ben was having all those issues, they just put the boat in the shed after the racing was over and fixed all the bugs, but they would have been rewriting software on a daily basis. And I remember in Bermuda, there wasn't a day that went by that we didn't get new software code. You know, we want to have better control of the twist function on the wing. So we would write, you know, okay, we need to, to be able to, who needs to do that? Oh, Gooby need to do it on the wing, but, you know, it'd be great if Purse could have the opportunity to do it if it was on the other side. So you just add a button and a switch and software designers love it because it, mm. they love to develop and evolve as well. And they're just so complicated. Do you think the spots. gap's closed up now? Between I the think challenges? the gap is closed up now, for sure. Do you think, I mean, I got, again, I got the sense after that practice session that we had before the start of the product up that actually the Kiwis pushed for that. I mean, that's, a, that's in the public domain. They pushed hard to be part of that practice session. And I was sort of asking myself, why would you necessarily want to do that if you were confident that you were such a long way ahead? And I, to me, it suggested they thought, I mean, they're not rattled by it, but they're conscious that the challenges have caught up quicker than they might have originally expected. I think the main reason why Team New Zealand pushed to be a part of those practice races is that they realised that they weren't racing well in December. I think that the, the team strategy right now is we are faster, we have more to come, another set of foils, probably more sets of sails to come, but they raced really badly. Like they didn't win a start, Pete was really rusty and he wasn't going to get another chance to go against another 75 until March. So they as a team would have decided it's more important that we get a few practice starts and a few more race strategies and get some set plays. And if the other teams catch us a little bit from that, I don't think they were as worried because they needed the race practice. Whereas every other team here is going to get racing every weekend. You know, they're going to get a lot of... And by the time that winner of the Prada Cup gets into the America's Cup, they're going to have done a lot of races. And Team New Zealand aren't. They got, they got one, two practice starts against Ben before they capsized. And then they got a bunch of starts against Dean the other day. And I can tell you one thing, like, what I saw on Tuesday when they did the second round of practice racing, Pete owned Dean Barker like I'd never seen before. He, he had him off the foils above the line. He had him shut out, tacking around to restart. He was sounding him through like, it was as if he got a rocket and said, Pete, do what you're paid to do and, <laughs> and race like you know, you're a champion. And, and he did that. And so you could say it was a success those two days for them. And now they're back on their own doing development. Mm, interesting. Well, I could go on all afternoon. Thank so you. Could I. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nathan. It's absolutely fascinating. Next time, we're going to find somewhere probably on the edge of a motorway because we want a little bit more background noise <laughs> with the trucks and everything else. Sorry about that. We just thought it was a nice view. Anyway, see you next time. Cheers. So once again, thanks to Nathan Outridge, a fascinating conversation. I certainly learnt loads from that. Now, before you go, don't forget to enter Spinlock's competition. They really do want to give away some kit. Here's a little reminder of what you've got to do. In the meantime, thank you so much for watching. Once again, stay safe, stay tuned. Until next time.